Our next presentation will be delivered by two members of our retina team, Dr. David Kleiman and uh, Vamsi Kulapali. David is a part-time part associate professor of ophthalmology. He's also the president and co-founder of Rochester-based Ion Therapeutics. David completed medical school in his ophthalmology residency at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Not sure why he came back, because I think he loved Colorado, but then uh, he came back. He went on to complete his fellowship in vitreoretinal surgery at the University of Toronto. In addition to his medical training, he completed his MBA at the Simon School of Business. Maybe that's why David came back. <laughs> so Dr. Kleinman is an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur interested in drug therapies for retinal disease, as well as devices to improve healthcare. He has vast experience in clinical trials and holds more than a dozen US patents related to ophthalmic care. Bamsey started out at the uh, FEI as a retina fellow. When he was finished, he wound up in Minnesota where he joined a private retinal practice. But the lure of academic medicine was too strong for him and Bamsey returned to Rochester four years ago as an associate professor. Bamsey received his medical training at Bangalore Medical College and came to the US to complete two, two postdoc fellowships, first at the University of Rochester and the second at the University of Southern California. He went on to Rutgers where he earned his doctorate in neuroscience followed by an ophthalmology residency. Besides his busy, busy clinical and surgical practice, he has research interest in stem cell and retinal transplantation for the treatment of degenerative retinal disease. Please enjoy this presentation, Acute Macula on Regnatogenous <laughs> Retinal Detachment. You can tell I'm an anterior segment person. <laughs> retinal Detachment Treatment Approaches. David and Vamsi, take it away. Dave and I were supposed to debate uh, how to treat acute uh, retinal uh, detachment uh, and how quickly, rather. That's the specific question that we are trying to answer. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes we get these calls, typical at four Friday, 4 p.m., from a panicked colleague or a patient saying that they have a macula on retinal detachment and need surgery, and the patient's in a you know, panicked state of mind. And we were trying to figure out should we or should we not do it? And when do we do it? Um, the second hypo hypothetical, it's I don't think we see that as often anymore, is a 2 a.m. call from the resident. Um, the For the longest time, the, the prevailing um, uh, uh, notion was that if you have a macula on, you want to operate within 24 hours. And if it's off, you kind of give up and then operate whenever you can, uh, which I think needs to be changed and we'll talk about it in a, 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 a in a little bit so we're going to have a discussion some of the nuances of the um, the various macula on detachments and probably freshly detached uh, uh, macula as well so what is the need for urgent uh, repair of a detached retina well it's because the photoreceptors are intimately involved with the uh, retinal pigment epithelium so the loss of that contact prolonged loss of that contact would result in a permanent loss of um, photoreceptors, which is which would be irreversible. How quickly do the photoreceptors start to die? Um, if you look at histological sections and look for uh, apoptosis, you can detect the signals as early as 12 hours and starts to peak by about two or three days. And by about two weeks or so, you have a fairly significant loss of these photoreceptors. And some of this is also confirmed uh, when you look at uh, adaptive optics studies uh, of patients with fovea on and fovea off uh, at post repair. There's a 30% reduction in the cone density and cone spacing uh, in patients of retinal attachment that have had a fovea off for about five days or so. So there is a need to rescue those photoreceptors, make sure that they don't die. But the surgeries have gotten better. Um, I mean, these days we get 80 to 95% anatomical success rate with single surgeries. Gone are the days when, I remember the day when I was holding the irrigated contact lens, keeping the inverted image in view for the surgeon was screaming at me for <laughs> moving the lens, but we do have better success rate. And so we're gonna talk about some cases and then discuss um, how would we approach, uh, what's the best way to approach uh, here. Uh, 
there are many factors that ultimately lead to affect the visual final visual outcome of which the duration of the detachment is the only one that we can control and that's what we're going to talk about so the first question when we see this uh, macula on detachment is is it really a, a regmatogenous retinal detachment and not something else and the reason i bring this up is because you see this uh, optus image and you can see a, a a detached retina sure technically yes it's detached but something else is going on and you can see the cord is not normal turns out it was a malignant process rather than a regmatogenous rd and we had to abandon the surgery here's another example of a macula on detachment that was rushed to the uh, for surgery turns out it's been there for a while and you can see some chronic changes that happened to be an incidental finding on um, uh, an exam so Dr. Kleinman has similar cases, and we're going to talk to some of these and then figure out which way to go about. Thanks, Bamsi. And I, you know, this isn't really a debate. I think we have our whole retina service, and, and probably you know the standard of care today. We're we're very much in line in how to approach these, um, you know, acute macula off and macula on regmatogenous detachments. And um, you know, Bamsi's super colleague, just want to tell you, I met him when I was like a first year resident or something, and he was at the U of R helping with stem cell transplantation. So we've known each other a long time and it's a great collaboration. Um, so, you know, obviously on retina, we're on call every fourth, it, we're, we're always on. And uh, as far as, and it's classic, 4 p.m. on a Friday, right? So this is a patient who presented, and we're just talking about approaches. So what are the approaches? I kind of wanted to do like yell questions, but it seems like it's not going to work very well. I'm kind of bummed. Um, so the ways to treat uh, retinal detachments, there's about four, right? The first is if it's a small circumscribed outside the arcades, I mean, you can laser it. It's not unreasonable, especially like if it's some superior detachment, it's not going to, you know, inferior there's there's really small areas that can be lasered and treated very well um once you've kind of decided that it's either progressing you, you know if it's progressing pretty quickly probably laser isn't a good idea but um but certainly uh there's other treatments that we can enact pretty quickly everything from straight vitrectomy straight buckle vitrectomy buckle and of course pneumatic so so there's multiple ways for us to reattach the retina and this is just a case I want to explain, just approaches, right? So this patient uh, presented about 6 p.m. Uh, one afternoon, and uh, I came in and examined the patient. We got a photograph. So I want folks to be able to see uh, inferior. Let me just, we have a little mouse or something. So, you, you know, folks can see there's a break here, sizable, uh, single break. So it's really, really important to do a good exam, right? And when we talk about regmatogenous detachments, there's a break. There's a break that's letting fluid go into the subretinal space. And why does that happen? It's because there's vitreous traction at the edge of the break, right? So the vitreous pulls on the retina and fluid, sinuretic fluid, tracks underneath the retina and it progresses over time. The rate of progression is really not the same for everybody. It can be super slow. And as Bomsi just presented, they can be stable for a long time. But so this patient has, you know, reasonable size break, acute symptoms, and you can see on the pictures, I just chose two of the images that, you know, it's certainly approaching the phobia by photography alone, right? And so what is a Mac on and a Mac off detachment? And, and we really think about it actually phobia, is the phobia involved? Because if you're outside the phobia, you know, you get the vision back. It's just not a big deal. It's really the foveal center where those, you know, 200,000 cones provide 20-20 vision. So, so this patient presented in the evening and I had a very specific plan for this patient when I saw her. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. Um, so it's 26 years old, healthy, no medical problems at all. And um, you saw the exam findings. He was 2040. And, you know, this is not stuff you need to get, by the way. We do it all the time, right? Don't even talk about ultrasound. But photographs, you know, OCTs, yeah, it's nice to present, but you don't need that stuff. And you can examine the eye. You can see it's macula on, macula off. So this is encroaching the center of the macula, right? So it isn't down a little bit. There can be some blood in the vitreous. There can be some sinewy cysts that causes some visual change. And um, so I did a procedure 
Um, and the next day, well, so actually, just so you guys know, the next day we talked to the patient. I said, here's what I want to do. Go home and prepare. So we did a procedure, you know, day five, day one, 2070, day five, 2050, 2050 again, a month out, 2040, day 42, 2020. And this is an OCT now from day 14. And can anyone pick out, is there anything abnormal about this or is this perfectly normal? Yeah, yeah. So there's a tiny little blab of subretinal fluid. That's common after procedures in, in retina. And we see it a lot with sclerobuckles. We see it with pneumatics. You don't see as much with, with vitrectomies because you're kind of flattening the retina by hand, but the fluid can be a little thick and re, re, stay around for a while, but it goes away eventually, okay? And so now we're a year out, the fluid's gone, the patient's 2020, super result, right? So what was the procedure? And people who know me can probably guess what I did here. Now, this is a little unique. Can somebody say why this is unique? Like you've seen me do, if any of my residents, fellows, we've seen me do a lot of pneumatics, but why was this case unique? It was inferior, right? Well, you have to judge your patient. And I said, look, why should we put a buckle around your eye? Why should I put you through surgery? Why should you go for a vitrectomy and get a cataract when you're 20, when you're 30 years old? Do you think you can go upside down for three days? Yeah, I can do it. Okay, so I did a pneumatic. This is what it looks like in drawing. This is what she looked like when she was positioning overnight. She came in the next day, she was reattached, kept her there for two more days, lasered her all 360. Just it, There's a lot to go behind that, but it prevents redetachment. And she had a super result. So that was a patient that we got to eh, ballpark it within 15 hours of presentation. Perfect result, doesn't happen all the time. That's, and I'm going to hand to Bamsi to tell, you know, a patient too. I just want to say a couple of things. MAC on detachments don't have 2020 outcomes. Okay. This is retinal surgery, epiretinal membrane, cystoid macular edema, cataracts develop. And then there's the biggest indicator or, 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 or risk factor for decreased acuity, which is redetachment. So you really want to make sure you get in at the right, you have your A team, you have everything lined up because that's one of the most important factors to having this be successful. So the, depend, the choice of surgery is really dependent on both the patient and the presentation, but also doing the surgery that gets you that 95% chance of single surgery success, even though across the board, everybody says 95%, but if you look in the literature and you, you know, Cochrane reports and stuff like that, it's really about 80% across the board that we have single surgery success. So, you know, we like to hold ourselves to higher standards. Now, pneumatics do have a little bit lower success rate. We have to accept that. So, you know, you want to go do pneumatics. You have to be ready to have that story and say, listen, didn't work. You still got fluid. I'm not happy with it. We got to go with the OR. But I don't usually think that that takes a hit to the long-term outcomes. Does that make sense? So like that is a pain for patients. And I'm going to hand over in one second. <laughs> Pneumatics are not easy. They're a lot of work. It's actually easier to go to the OR and do a vitrectomy and knock it out, see the patient day one, day seven, day 14, okay? Pneumatics, first of all, you're moving around, lasering them, putting, taking a gas bubble, a tap, cryo, and then you got to watch them the next day and look for fluid. And if it's coming, you got to reposition them and you got to see them three days later and then you got to finish your laser. So it's a lot of work, but I love it because I think it has great outcomes. Okay. Yeah. Agree with you, but I also agree that the I also think that the vitrectomy does too. Here's an example of a pneumatic that failed. Um, the physician tried to try the vitrectomy, failed again. So we came to Rochester. We did a, a vitrectomy to clean that up. To make the point that the biggest fear is that macula is off, you're losing the photoreceptors, you're losing vision, but no, you can still get the vision back. So macula off is not a, 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 a death sentence to the photoreceptors. And so this is the outcome for that patient after surgery, 2025, after three surgeries. So not bad. So what is it that we are afraid of? Uh, here's another example of a macula off. Um, after a vitrectomy, a few days of macula off, ended up with 2025. So the question is, if your patient comes in with a macula on, what is the risk of developing, say, macular off uh, in 24 hours, it's very low. So you can, you don't need to rush into the operating room that same day, you could, you could have some time. And even for whatever reason, if there's a delay in the, in the surgery, a few days will still be okay. And one of the ways you can uh, uh, decrease that risk is let's say it's a superior detachment, which has the greatest risk because the gravity is pushing the subretinal fluid down. 
you could have the patient positioned so that you can slow down the movement of the fluid and considerably, and as you can see the numbers here, uh, a positioning can help. Um, and so here are the few scenarios. Uh, it's more than just a phobia on or phobia off. And among the five, which one you think would need to be done a little bit more urgently or how would you manage uh, each of those? I mean, I, I probably would say go for phobia splitting. You know, I think that you're starting to get some of the apoptosis. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, that was a, a quiz for me, and I'm answering choice. Not a quiz, choice five. Discussion. Choice How would five. Your approach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's closer to the phobia, the urgency kind of starts to go up. And um, I, I would say the phobia splitting RD is the one that I fear most because. I cannot control how the phobia is going to settle down and what after effects the patient will have that even if he has 2025 20, could suffer quite a bit. Um, and there's enough evidence to show that um, that if you do the surgery, even after macula off, if it's done within three days or even five days, you do a fairly good um, uh, visual acuity uh, 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 return there. Um, and there's really not a huge difference between macula on, macula off, if, if it's done fairly quickly. Uh, but you're right, even if it's a macula on does not guarantee a 2020, you could have complications that could lead to. And maybe I can make a couple of comments. Yeah. So, so first, there's a, a lot of people that have looked at this. Like this is, the, the literature is rife with papers from all regions of the world with duration of macular de detachment, visual acuity outcomes, procedure, visual acuity outcomes, Mac on versus Mac off. Um, so one of the things that to give you a little historical perspective, right, is that at, at one point in time, people believed, oh my gosh, the sooner we get to this patient, the better. Okay, that was an initial belief. And then it kind of said, well, listen, um, Mac on is urgent slash emergent. Mac off less than 24 hours is urgent slash emergent. But Mac on a day, you know, let's let's not really worry about that and get that done within five, seven days. And that was some literature that was coming out out of Ross and then Hassan that said, you know, look, zero to seven, one to seven, one to 10, the same. Doesn't matter. You look at day two, you look at day eight. But, you know, the literature is always biased. This is surgical literature. It's retrospective, typically, and it, and it evolves. And people are sort of doing larger cohorts of studies. And so in the last few years, there's been some evidence that it's the first three days. Like, let's say 24 hours or less, we can probably consider it the same outcomes as a MAC on. But you start to go one to three, it's probably better to, you know, 24 hours off. It's probably better to repair it within 72 hours. Okay. There's no difference between day two and day three or day one and day three, but three to four to six is showing a slight difference. Um, and then, but once you're out past day seven to 10, it really doesn't matter. You've got a week to do it. Okay. That's just a trend, but it's more important to get it done correctly. And also there's other factors. What's the preoperative visual acuity? How much fluid is there? How long has it been there? So there's a lot of factors that can guide your decision-making. Yeah. All right, so kind of uh, same point again, phobia threatening would be what I would prior prioritize and the rest I think we can, um, we don't have to force the issue. And the reason why we have to also think about the bigger picture is that it's the fight to get the OR, get the patients, uh, get the staff to show up uh, or stay overnight. And the reimbursement for an emergent retinal detachment is the same as a uh, regular day, a weekday procedure. And then finally, if you were to rush in in the middle of the day, uh, you're putting the rest of the patients on hold while you finish the surgery. So you need to balance out uh, um, the other issues as well. And then finally, uh, as I say to uh, uh, to my fellow all the time, treat the patient, not just the retina, just because it's a detached retina doesn't mean you have to jump in and then do the surgery. Yeah, fair. No, thanks. And I think we can start to wrap up and maybe take some questions. Right. But just so folks know, like, what are the outcomes? Like, you know, these are ranges because every paper is different. But classic MAC off detachment, about 50% of people are going to be 25th year worse. Classic MAC off, 2400 presentation. Um, when you start to talk about MAC on detachments, it can be even, uh, so it's important to think of how these 
statistics are done. They're done in log mar visual acuity. You gotta remember that you can't do statistics on decimal visual acuity. You can't do statistics on 2030, 2040. So it's all log mar. And so 0, 0.0 is the same as 2020. So 0.1 difference is every line, right? So about 0.3, some papers show about 0.3 to 0.4 in Mac on detachment, median results. Okay. You think it's a little better and some groups are better, but Mac off for three days is the same as that. You start to go out to step five, seven days. You're starting to look at 50% people worse than 2040, 2050. And 2050 is kind of an important cutoff because that's where you're driving legal drops for most states. 2040 in New York state, other states are 2050. So, and of course there can be other factors. If, if the patient, first of all, like we won't even talk about macular hole detachments, but you know, the patient has end stage macular degeneration or has an epiretinal membrane has had been 2060. I mean, there's reasons that you don't have to go urgently because your outcome is never going to be 2020. So, um, Tom, any more comments? Maybe we take a couple of questions before I have to dash no. out of here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, when we have patients that come in like late on Fridays or, you know, in the ER at 2 a.m., um, a lot of the time they've had their detachments or they've been symptomatic for a day or several days. So for you and your clinical decision-making and when to take them, um, does the clock start based on the history, like when they're symptomatic or when they actually show up? So this is, um, the, the time is considered when the patient notices loss of central vision is the time when the clock st starts for Mac off. So the patient could have said, I have two, I, two weeks ago, I started seeing something up here and then it started to get bigger and they come in and they're, you know, at the arcades. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when central visual acuity is gone. That's the, the countdown for DMD, duration of macro detachment. You know, when you talk about the statistics and looking at the studies, then they also talk about time to surgeries. That's another category. And that's the time from diagnosis to surgery, okay? And, you know, just a comment about that. I mean, you're getting a call from somebody and look, accept the calls, right? You're residents and you got to see the patients, but you, you can also, if you have a chance to get in there and say, Hey, look, you're calling me at nine o'clock at night, you're in Buffalo, the patients, you know, it, it, everything sounds like we can take care of this fine tomorrow. Like it's really okay. All right. That's what we're trying to convey here is that this is not a 3 a.m. procedure. Do those procedures exist? Yeah, you know, intraocular foreign bodies, you, you kind of have to jump through the hoops at some of those things. But we need to settle down a little bit from a MAC on detachment, which can certainly be done safely within a certain number of hours from the, uh, the time you hear about it. So, uh, so the last two uh, talks are going to be uh, uh, very interesting. Um, the next talk will be by uh, Susanna Marcos. And what can I say about uh, Susanna Marcos that hasn't been sent already? Well, I'm going to say some. Susanna is uh, the David Williams Director in the Center for Visual Science, the Nicholas George Professor of Optics at the University of Rochester Institute of Optics. She's also the pro a professor of ophthalmology at the Eye Institute. Uh, Susanna is an acclaimed researcher in the field of visual optics and ocular imaging. She's a pioneer in the development of new techniques for evaluation of the eye, including retinal imaging, in, 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 retinal imaging instruments, aberrometers, adaptive optics, anterior segment imaging of the eye, and intraocular lens designs. Dr. Marcos earned her bachelor and PhD degrees in, in physics at the University of Stel Salamanca, Spain, before coming to Rochester. She was director of the Institute of Optics for the Spanish National Research Council, where she founded the Visual Optics and Biophonics Lab in 2000. She has completed postdoctoral research at Shepin's Eye Institute. Susanna was published, has published more than 180 highly cited articles and is inventor of 20 patent families. Her research has been key in creating the spin-off companies Planoptica and Two Eyes Vision, which she co-founded in 2015. These companies commercialized uh, Quixi and the Simvis uh, technology. And if any of you haven't seen the Simvis technology, I showed a little hand at that today. 
Um, it's really impressive. It's a well, it looks like a virtual reality system, but it actually simulates uh, all these different intraocular lenses that you can you can get on the market in the U.S. Very innovative. Her awards and accolades are too numerous to elaborate here for time's sake, but I'd like to let you know that Suzanne is the 2023 recipient of the Edward Land Award for her pioneering work to create inventions, technology, and products. She's the third woman to be honored um, in the award in 30 years. Please welcome Susanna Marcos as she presents IOL Designs. Very simple. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for, for the invitation to be here uh, talking about IOL design. Um, I don't plan this to be like an optics class. Uh, I try to I try to uh, to get a little bit of understanding of, uh, you know, what's behind the IOLs that um, surgeons typically use uh, and how uh, we can learn about them by evaluating uh, both the, the crystalline lens in, in, the, in the young eye and, and how it changes with aging. Um, and also how we can plan for the best intraocular lens to be designed and implanted in uh, in someone's eye. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, the twice vision that was mentioned before, uh, numerous patents on IOC signs and disclosures um, uh, concerning um, like other, other companies in the field. So um, I will be covering mainly three three areas in, in, in the talk today. So one is understanding the lens designs and their impact on vision. Uh, and part of it involves um, measuring them on bench, um, simulating them in, 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 in a computer, and also simulating the vision with uh, intraocular lenses uh, with these um, uh, visual simulators. And also how uh, we have gained understanding of the of prior lenses of the of the human crystalline lens to come up with new uh, lens designs. So, uh, what should we know about the lens? Um, we've heard from from Dr. Werner before about the lens materials. Um, lens material is, is is important also from an optical perspective because there's a number of properties that uh, determine uh, the uh, the performance of the of the lens, and that involves a refractive index, AB number. Uh, the tra tra transmittance, the mechanical properties, the water content, and physical chemical properties, and and obviously the optical lens design that encompasses the surface lens profile, uh, anterior and posterior, radius of curvature, conic constants, uh, if it's a diffractive optics, you know how is this a uh, diffractive structure, uh, point by point elevation maps, thickness, uh, and haptics geometry. So if we have all these, there is a bunch of things that we can actually understand about the lens and, and simulate them in a computer and uh, simulate them posteriorly in, um, in visual simulators. However, what we normally find in uh, the typical brochure of, uh, of a manufacturer are kind of vague um, concepts and, and vague inscriptions, right? Uh, we may find uh, statements like, these are the only way from design IOL, or it has reduced spherical collaboration or improved functional vision, has it modified as spherical anterior surface, or it's functional for intermediate vision. And uh, the lens material doesn't get more um, detail. Uh, they talk about proprietary hydrophobic acrylic, or it has a low chromatic aberration, or it's unique material. Um, generally, we should know more about those lenses uh, in order to take to make decisions on uh, what are they um, best serving the patients. So if the design or material information is not given to, uh, to you, I, th I think um, uh, we should be at least asking the manufacturers to, uh, to tell us about the principle of operation, uh, whether it's a refractive, a diffractive, a hybrid um, IOL, particularly with EDOF IOLs. Uh, you may heard about EDOF IOLs and uh, depending on the manufacturer, that may mean uh, a diffractive intraocular lens where um, it has like two peaks, but they play with the chromatic aberration to kind of fill in uh, the signal between the two peaks. Um, but normally in optics, an EDOF lens would be a refractive uh, element that is uh, smooth. Um, I think we should also ask about stray collaboration and if there are other higher order terms. Also, what's the pupil dependence, uh, whether 
um, you know, it changes uh, across pupil diameters or uh, if it's constant across pupil diameter and also uh, the through focus performance of this lens. And uh, this is something that you may uh, sometimes find in, in patents or, or publications. What is this through focus um, MTF uh, that is generally obtained uh, on bench? So if we had like a more specific information of the lens, we can actually do um, many things to understand how the lens works. Uh, so the first thing that an optical engineer would do is actually place this uh, lens in a computer model of the eye and uh, and estimate the wavefront aberration. And from that, you can actually uh, calculate how's the modulation transfer function. So how much contrast uh, is reduced uh, with the uh, amount of detail in the image and also the default focus, the true focus performance of this lens. And you can do that in a generic eye model, but you can actually do it also at the patient level. Uh, so with this uh, 3D quantitative imaging of the eye that we have um, um, developed uh, in recent years, we can actually build specific eye models where we introduce the anatomy of the eye. And um, by doing that, we will take into account not only the, the lens design, but also the topography of the cornea, the interocular distances, the tilt and disintegration of the lens, and really uh, be able to uh, predict uh, how is the optical quality going to be uh, in a patient's eyes. Uh, in fact, when we compare the wave aberrations that we measure uh, with a uh, standard aberrometer, and we compare that with the ray tracing that we do on this computer model eye that is patient specific, we actually find a really good correspondence between the simulated wavefront aberration and the measured wavefront aberration. And this is great because we now can have like this platform where we can actually play, right? And we can replace the interocular lens that um, is in this eye uh, virtually um, by another interocular lens design. And we can predict uh, what's the optical quality going to be uh, with a different lens. Um, these uh, type of models are also um, very um, handy for uh, what we believe is going to be the next generation of uh, IO power uh, selection. So if you go to current uh, and standard formulas for intraocular lens selection, uh, they're not based on a full understanding of the design or the intra or the um, anatomy of the eye, right? Uh, they generally just use the, the radius of curvature of the cornea and the actual length. However, if you have like all this information um, in 3D of the eye, uh, you're going to, to be able to do a retinal image simulation and actually select the lens that produces the best optics. Um, one one uh, feature that is very important uh, when selecting the intraocular lens is uh, predicting where the lens is going to fall uh, within the eye. Uh, this is so-called ELP, like estimated lens position. Um, by having um, this three-dimensional information of the eye, particularly of the crystalline lens, uh, we're uh, much more accurate in determining when the lens where the lens is going to uh, to end up being, which is critical for uh, for the power estimation. Uh, this is work that we're doing uh, uh, here at FEI um, in collaboration with Dr. Celik and and Dr. McRae and uh, and uh, Dr. Ansa, and also in collaboration with the Center uh, of Excellence for Data Science, the Gergen Institute of Data Science, where we are combining these uh, custom uh, intraocular lens. Um, implantation in, in a model eye with um, uh, architectures of artificial intelligence and machine learning to relate uh, this pre-op data of the eye with the location where the lens is uh, is implanted. Um, so uh, the the system works like this. It's, uh, so we have these uh, images from OCT, and this is actually coming from um, standard IO Master 700 images, but now with our um, model constructions and and, uh, and distortion corrections and, and modeling and, and algorithms that we uh, have developed to move from the images that are provided by uh, a commercial OCT system into a model that actually uh, extrapolates even the crystalline and shape. So the input data that we have now for uh, model and the prediction of the of the intraocular lens position uh, is not only the uh, the uh, biometry 
that you normally use in 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 cataract surgery planning, but but also the crystalline lens thickness, the uh, the radius of curvature of the of the lens, and even the three dimensional information of the lens. Uh, so so we have trained these uh, these machine learning method and. Uh, uh, we have looked at uh, what's the benefit um, of uh, including more information and these um, machine learning architectures over standard uh, intraoperative lens positions. And we're seeing that um, the number of, of eyes where the error, for example, and this is the metric, uh, where the errors in the estimation of the ELP is uh, above 200 microns is uh, dramatically reduced uh, when we're using uh, these uh, much um, broader information of the of the crystalline lens um, uh, apart from other biometric uh, parameters. So it's not only uh, knowing the design of the lens, it's also knowing where the lens is going to fall. And uh, it's moving from uh, standard formulas that are based on um, average uh, data in the population to a more customized um, analysis of where the lens is going to fall and, and how it's going to be combined with um, uh, aberrations and, and topography of the cornea and the alignment uh, in the eye. So if we have this information, and that includes information of the material and the ABI number, we, we can also predict the longitudinal chromatic aberration of the eye, which also interacts with the monochromatic aberrations and, and varies with the materials. Um, we can also predict halos and glare, um, so we can perform simulations of what a halo would be uh, when we have these, uh, for example, diffractive optics. Um, and we can also even predict uh, the positive and negative isotopsias and, and light efficiencies by knowing uh, the designs of this lens and, uh, and the diffractive profiles when we're talking about um, lenses that are um, uh, multifocal and uh, that also combines with other features that are not necessarily in the optical zone of the lens, like the uh, the, the shape of the uh, edges, uh, the index of refraction, um, the whether the the design is by by convex or uh, or the pupil diameter. So uh, I guess the bottom line of all of this is that if you have this comprehensive information of the intraocular lens, and and if you add that to the parameters of the eye. Uh, you can really very accurately uh, know what's the optical quality of the image that is projected on the retina, and you can uh, select uh, the lens accordingly. Um, but of course, uh, this is only optics, uh, but these lenses are combined, of course, with the patient's brain. Uh, so uh, ideally, uh, you don't only want to uh, predict computationally how an intraocular lens design is going to work on a model or a computer eye, uh, or how is it going to work on bench? You want to see how the patient is going to see through that lens, uh, and that's the purpose of um, of the uh, of the simulators. Uh, in this case, um, um, we are replacing an intraocular lens in a cuvette. Uh, we're projecting that on the patient's eye, um, and uh, what we see is that uh, when we compare the on bench um, through focus performance of this lens. Uh, measured on an artificial eye, you get like these uh, um, different um, through focus performances of a, of a monofocal lens or a trifocal lens or a, or a need of lens that is uh, very well reproduced uh, in terms of visual acuity, the focus curves when you uh, when the, the patient sees through uh, the lens uh, or these different lens designs uh, in, in, in a cuvette that is projected on eye. Uh, of course, this is static, but there is something else that we can do uh, to make this uh, more uh, open and, um, and versatile. Uh, and uh, this is where adaptive optics uh, comes in. So adaptive optics is a technology that is uh, inherited from astronomy, uh, where it's used to correct the aberrations of the atmospheric turbulence. Uh, so um, we and others have brought this technology down to the optical bench uh, and to ophthalmology in some cases to correct the uh, optics of the eye, to actually see the eye, uh, the retina, uh, with a higher contrast and higher resolution. Uh, we're using it here the other way around. So basically we're using it to manipulate the optical aberrations to, um, to, um, to measure how the eye is going or how vision is going to be changed when we uh, 
either correct the aberrations uh, with a super uh, correcting lens, or when we are um, implanting a, an intraocular lens in the eye. So um, this is a view of the uh, adaptive optics uh, simulator in, in, in our lab here. Uh, it has super continuum laser source so that we can uh, measure uh, visual quality and optical quality in uh, in, in different colors and, and in white light. Uh, and it, it has the formable mirror, spatial light modulator, where we can actually simulate different lenses. So we can measure the optical quality of the eye through those lenses, uh, and we can perform uh, visual function measurements through these manipulated optics. In particular, we can simulate lenses that are either commercial lenses, and uh, this is a list of uh, the uh, different lens manufacturers that we have programmed in the in in the device um, to perform sa something like we can say like a virtual uh, surgery, right? Uh, so we we can have the patient testing the lenses uh, before they're implanted in the eye. And, and we can actually play with any uh, design we want. I mean, here, the sky is the limit. We can map any manageable uh, lens design. And these are examples of different designs. Some are uh, uh, corresponding to existing lenses, but uh, or there are uh, just uh, designs that we came up with uh, that can be symmetric or asymmetric. Um, they can be center distance or center near. Um, uh, and in the bottom line, there are designs that um, we have been uh, given by by Clario Vision, coll collaborating with um, with Lens Selectniac uh, uh, for um, for for a project where we're testing perspective uh, uh, multifocal contact lenses. We can also um, play with the the orientation of those lenses, and we can look at visual uh, visual performance, uh, assuming different. Um, uh, rotations of uh, of an asymmetric bifocal uh, intraocular lens, for example. So the idea is that we can actually think on a design. You can put that on the visual simulator, and you can test vision through these new uh, intraocular lens designs without touching the eye. Um, the uh, uh, through focus performance of uh, multifocal intraocular lenses or EDOF lenses are um, um, normally given in in the literature. And we are using those as a primary information for uh, visual simulations. In particular, the visual simulations that now are not uh, performed in an optical bend, but are, are actually uh, performed using um, a see-through uh, visual simulator. This is the SIMVIS that uh, Scott was um, uh, referring to. This is a wearable device. Uh, it's binocular, it's see-through, it has a wide field of view is fully programmable. And now the patient can actually see the world through simulated intraocular lenses or contact lenses that are programmed in this uh, in this system. Uh, it can simulate therefore multifocal or EDOF uh, corrections. It can also um, pro, uh, simulate monovision. Uh, so you can give one eye for far, the other one eye for near, you can give a panopsis in one eye and, and a VVT in the other eye. Uh, you can really see how the patient uh, is, is seen through uh, existing uh, multifocal lenses in the market, uh, or we can also play with it to um, to simulate lenses that are still not available. It works under the principle of temporal multiplexing. Uh, so we actually uh, drive uh, an optotunable lens at a very high speed uh, so that it provides the static appearance of a multifocal retinal image. Uh, and this is an example here, for example, a trifocal lens uh, where um, we account for uh, the time that this lens is spent at a given time, and you can see um, a validation of um, simulation uh, on bench where you see like an optotype through, see through uh, the simulator or through the real uh, multifocal lens. Of course, we can bring that to patient and we can transfer uh, the uh, lenses that are uh, standard in, in clinical practice to the device, and we can compare these through focus visual acuity curves uh, with the real design uh, implanted in the eye uh, or with the design that is actually now programmed in the system. And you can clearly see uh, in the left, there's the panoptics, there is the, the fine vision. These are trifocal lenses. You see like these are more uh, expanded the default focus, uh, like two or uh, even three peaks, um, as opposed to the uh, 
so-called Edof lens symphony that has entire default focus and that is captured both uh, with a uh, with a simulator and the real implanted lens. So um, we can we can uh, produce uh, these uh, multifocal lenses. Uh, of course, uh, they do not like all, like the real crystalline lens. Um, the crystalline lens is actually serving us as an inspiration for new intraocular lenses. Uh, these are a bunch of results that are from from um, our lab where uh, we're looking at the lens topography, the gradient index distribution of the of the of the real uh, lens, uh, lens dynamics. Uh, and then the entire lens uh, volume uh, and the mechanical properties of the lens. Uh, of course, uh, these dynamic changes in the lens only occur in young uh, eyes, and, and this is lost with, with age. Um, this is something that we'd like to uh, restore, right? So um, these are just uh, examples of how the crystalline lens changes in the young eye, in this case with accommodation. And these are measurements obtained from this uh, 3D quantitative OCT. Um, changes with age, um, uh, changes uh, with uh, with myopia. So there's a wide range of uh, crystalline lens um, dimensions. Uh, some changes that occur with age, of course, accommodation, and also with refractive error. Um, so just having this breadth of information is is important, and I think that links with uh, Dr. Celik's talk. He was talking about the crystalline lens and the capture back. We're now able to do the sizing uh, of the of the perspective intraocular lenses because we have this information now at the patient level. Uh, but knowing about the lens is uh, actually allowing us to uh, to uh, design new intraocular lenses that are more um, like nature inspired. Uh, one uh, example is the isopure intraocular lens, uh, which is an EDOF lens. Uh, this is now uh, licensed to uh, to uh, BVI physio and is implanted in I think around forty five countries uh, at the moment. And this has like a smooth profile, uh, more uh, similar to that of uh, of the crystalline lens. Um, and um, well, it's it's based on merging the concepts of uh, optical design. Uh, in this case, we call it multi multi configuration optimization, uh, where we can actually play with the shape of the lens uh, to expand the foot focus. Um, of course, the ultimate solutions for presbyopia would be accommodating intraocular lenses. Um, Dr. Uh, Werner has mentioned about uh, some. Uh, I think they have been non-successful in general uh, for many reasons. Uh, they assume that the lens is squeezed to accommodate, which is not uh, true. Uh, they're dependent on the elasticity of the capsular back, and we've seen how much the capsular back changes with uh, capsular rexis, and they depends on the size of the capsular back. Uh, and um, this is... Um, this is actually the result of uh, the crystal lens where you know it shifts actually in the wrong direction, uh, not achieving uh, proper uh, accommodation or refractive changes. Um, it, this lens uh, just moved actually. So um, this, the concept that we came up with in, uh, in the light lens approach is actually something that resembles more uh, the natural accommodation of the eye. So this is a lens that has this uh, separation of the capture back as referred before. Uh, and it changes the uh, the curvature of the lens. Uh, it changes not because of the capture back uh, squeezing or reshaping the lens, but actually because the the haptics of the lens are engaged with the preferred region of the capture back, and that produces this stretching that we need to disaccommodate uh, and the release of forces uh, that um, make the the lens more round to accommodate to accommodate. Uh, so this is the first uh, prototype that has been produced and tested experimentally ex vivo. And uh, this is coupled with this uh, uh, capsule engaging uh, using light, uh, which we call photobonding. So the, the haptics are engaged with the preferred region of the capsule back to capture the forces uh, from the ciliary muscle. Mm. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, I try to convey that understanding the intraocular lens designs uh, by asking information uh, about them will allow to assess optical performance of the intraocular lens and also customize ideal selection uh, to the patient's eye anatomy and visual needs. 
uh, if possible, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to have the patient experience vision with a given lens before implantation, and then understanding crystalline lens geometry, optics, and mechanics that serves as an inspiration for new intraocular lens systems. And I leave it here with, uh, with our contact information. Thank you. Um, we have questions, comments. Dave, one question. Dave's gonna, Dave's gonna cut it off. For the light lens, I'm curious, what's the material of the lens you are testing for that? Yeah, so the material is uh, like off the shelf contact lens material. is uh, is basically uh, a P HEMA. Mm -hmm. So hydrogel, yeah. Yeah, so it's a high, it's a hydrogel. Uh, we would like to expand on this material to um, achieve, uh, I mean, have like a lower Young's modulus and a higher in index of refraction to expand the current range, which is about 1.5 diopters to, you know, larger range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw also that you use your systems to evaluate negative and positive dysphotopsia, which is such a big deal also. So just uh, I was curious if uh, the results you are finding for negative dysphotopsia confirm other studies where they think it is related to a non-illuminated band of the nasal retina. So yeah, yeah, in your that, studies, you and, find that too? Yeah, and those are, those are not measurements. Those are, those are actually uh, computer simulations. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, without the, the experimental um, counterpart, uh, I would say, so from the computer simulations. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So um, we get to come to the final talk uh, by Dr. Zlonsniak. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, him. Len is the uh, chief vision scientist for Clario Vision. Clario is a startup company that has its roots in Rochester, this can be traced to a collaboration between the Eye Institute, the Institute of Optics, and the Center for Visual Science. The company focuses on using a femtosecond, a very, very, very high speed femtosecond laser um, technology to change refractive index uh, of a man-made lens materials in human, in human cornea. Len originally uh, became part of th this collaboration as a student at the University of Rochester where he completed his BS, MS, and PhD in optics. He did much of his optics training in the laboratories of Wayne Knox, helping to develop a process called laser-induced refractive index change. The technology allows us to precisely change the refractive properties of a variety of materials without ablation. It can be used in several applications like customizing contact lenses, changing the refractive index of an IOL in situ in, in uh, post-op patients, and changing the focusing power of the cornea. So it's a very promising technology, and Dr. Werner's been working on that uh, that same concept uh, in Salt Lake City as well. As mentioned, Len is a graduate of the University of Rochester's Institute of Optics. He has more than a dozen peer-reviewed publications that date all the way back to his student days. As chief vision scientist at Clarity, he's responsible for leading a research team changing the way we look at lasers to shape human vision. This, this technology is really exciting. And uh, Len's been right on the uh, cusp of it. Um, Len's going to be talking about uh, myopic progression and its control, fundamental mechanisms and challenges. And I just want to say that uh, Len is a fantastic public speaker. <laughs> Every time I've ever listened to him at the Wayfront Congress or whatever, he always wins best paper. So he's a really good translational. He's a physicist, but he's fantastic at translating uh, complex ideas down to, um, to um, normal ophthalmologists, um, easily ophthalmologists like you and me. So then take it away. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hi folks. Wow, end of the day. Let's switch gears a little bit from cataract surgery, which happens later in life, to children and what happens in the early, maybe first two decades of life. I have a financial disclosure. I'm, I work for a company where I have patents and equity called ClaroVision, but I'm not gonna talk at all about that technology in this talk. What I am gonna talk to you about is these three things. What is normal eye growth? What is myopia progression? And what can we do about it? 
So let's start by just setting the stage and let's talk about emetropization and defining some basic definitions of normal eye growth. So in, I'm not that I'm not this kind of doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. So correct me if I'm wrong, but there are lots of organs in the body. And right. And and when we were born as a little baby, they're little. You have a little heart, little kidney, little lungs, and they have to grow for like 20 years until you become full grown and then you stop growing and that's it. The eyeball is unique because it's the only organ in the whole body where this growth mechanism, it's regulated by photons. It's regulated by light. You know, the kidneys don't care what light is. I guess you could make an argument for the brain as being in that bucket too. But the eyes are regulated by light. It's the only organ like that. It's very interesting. There's a wonderful paper that's held up really well over the years. It's almost 20 years old uh, from Josh Wallman and Jonathan Winnor. And I highly recommend, if you really want to dig into myopia progression and myopia control, to check out this paper, Homeostasis of Eye Growth and the Question of Myopia. <clears throat> so in general, when you're born, eyeball starts out very little. And for the eye to be in focus, you need to have a coordinated development of the anterior and posterior segments of the eye. The focal length of the eye, which is determined by your cornea and your crystalline lens, has to match the, act, the length of the eye so that your retina is in the focal plane. And this is just a cartoon of a growth chart. But in general, um, we're born hyperopic, where our eyes are too short. And over the course of a few years, the eye rapidly grows um, until the retina is close to the focal plane. And that's what we call emetropia. When the eye is in focus, this is emetropia. You, as an engineer, you could look at this system and call it a feedback control system. A feedback control system, it's kind of a fancy way of saying, well, if, let's say you're making spaghetti sauce. What is feedback control when you're making spaghetti sauce? You taste it. And if it doesn't taste right, maybe you add something to it and then you taste it again. This is closed loop feedback. Stir the pot, taste it. You look at something, maybe it's not salty enough, add a little bit of salt, taste it again. That's feedback control. So the eye does this all the time during growth. So when you're in, encountering negative defocus, so you have a near object, your eye can do lots of things to accommodate for that. Besides shrinking your pupil size, it can accommodate. Your choroid can thicken and the eye can increase in length via growth. So we know that the eye is a feedback mechanism because of decades of animal studies. So for example, in chicks, um, from the work of Frank Schaeffel, Adrian Glasser, and Howard Howland, you can put a lens of either positive power or negative power onto a developing chick eye and watch its refraction change over time. The eye will grow to the length, whatever the optics dictate to it, the eye will grow to that, to that length. So the input that goes into this visual system we could call this our visual diet. And I'm working up to it here, but um, you know, there's an epidemic, not just COVID, but of myopia around the world, especially in Eastern Asia, where over 90% of young people are myopic. Their eyes are too long because they've been consuming the wrong diet. So in the same way, we have a lot of diabetics um, nowadays, a lot more diabetics than we had a thousand years ago because our nutritional diet has changed. The same thing with myopia, our visual diet has changed. We don't live out in the savanna as we evolved for millions of generations any longer. We live indoors. So these myopogenic stimuli, stimuli that make the eye become myopic, we, there's a few different types of them. For one, near objects. So here's a schematic of the eye. And if you have an infinitely far point source, then the wavefront of the light is planar. Now you're in Rochester, New York, so you should all know about wavefronts and what a wavefront is because of what's happened here over the last like 30 years. So a collimated beam has a wavefront. Now, one cheating way of remembering it is a wavefront or a surface of constant optical phase is perpendicular to the light rays. So if you have light rays that are all um, collimated there, then the wavefront is a flat wavefront. Now, if you put on a negative lens, like a negative spectacle lens, a minus lens, like a trial lens in front of the eye, and you look at this collimated beam, you'll see this red diverging beam after it. Now the wavefront is a diverging spherical wave. That negative wave pushes the focal length behind the retina, and that's one of those myopogenic stimuli. That's the grow signal. But you could also replace that lens in front of the eye with a near object. 
the eye doesn't know the difference. The retina cannot tell the difference between something that's close up or something that's far away and you're wearing a negative lens in front of your eye. The wave fronts are identical. So near objects, these are myopogenic stimuli. In this paper from Flitcroft, Ian Flitcroft, um, 2012, he took uh, images of natural scenes um, out on the street, in a park, or in an office. You can tell it's kind of old because of that like computer monitor. And then the color map there is in units of diopters, or how far is an object. So you, a unit of a diopter, it's an inverse meter. So three diopters, it's a third of a meter away. So just look at the colors. You'll immediately see in the top panel where you see images of things outside, well, the, the color map, the object distance map is all blue. Everything is basically far away, optically far away, pretty close to optical infinity, as opposed to being indoors where the computer monitor there or the the desktop and the rim of the mug there is up to three diopters away. This is near vision. So when you're not accommodating yet, but if you've not accommodated and you're in the presence of, I'm looking at you, but I have this microphone kind of in my face. These are myopogenic stimuli that um, give a grow signal to the retina. Um, of course, there's a genetic um, aspect to myopia development. If your parents are myopic, you're more likely to be myopic, but that's not the full story. Really, myopia is a behavioral problem because we spend too much time indoors. So for example, this paper um, following a population of 870 kids in Israel, in Israel, um, both at a religious and secular schools, you can see here the x-axis plot is um, refractive error, the y-axis is prevalence. And for the religious school females that don't read Torah every day, and the secular school, male or female, they emetropize just fine. But in this same religious school, so this is one genetic population. Um, the religious school males, where they read Torah for many hours a day, which has very fine print and very close up, they become myopic. So behavior is a really big part of it. This visual diet is a big part of it. So if you know little kids, you should get them outside as, as often as possible so that they consume the proper diet of far vision in sunlight with the right spectrum and everything. Um, I got a kick out of these images from a newspaper in a Chinese school. You'll see the prevalence numbers in a moment, but they even installed these bars on Chinese desks um, to prevent kids from coming too close up to the desk surface to try and keep things a little far away. And I have a daughter who's eight now, but she's just like this. Like, you know, there's always going to be compliance issues. You know, some kids just like looking around the thing. So another myopogenic stimuli, not only... Uh, object proximity, but it is light level, how bright are things. So this comes from a, a friend in uh, Argentina, Rafael Erbarin, who uh, measured the luminance or brightness of light under different conditions. And this that bar graph is on a logarithmic scale. So those small, short blue bars, um, that's like hundreds of times dimmer. It's actually hundreds of hundreds, even thousands of times dimmer indoors right in here than it is outside on a cloudy even on a cloudy day or in the shade. So the outside really is a lot brighter. I'm not even talking about the spectrum yet. You know, there's a whole discussion about the spectrum of, of what colors are emitted from um, fluorescent and, and black body lighting versus uh, the spectrum of sunlight. That was the wrong button. Okay. So back to this diagram. Visual diet. Visual diet is very important. And um, the other contributing factors are genetics and biomechanics. So for the retina to be in the right place, to be in the focal plane so that things are in focus, you can see there's this push-pull. There has to be a balance, a coordination between your grow signals and the stop signals. So those grow signals are genetics, myopogenic stimuli. What are the stop signals? So I'll just list some things we know from literature. We know that um, the retina has a class of cells called dopaminergic amacrine cells. There's dopamine in the retina, and dopamine in the retina can only come from one place. It's these dopaminergic amacrine cells. Those are little dopamine factories sprinkled throughout the retina. Um, in eyes, which are myopic, they do not have enough dopamine. Um, dopamine concentration increases with light intensity. It increases with contrast. Uh, behind the RPE layer of the retina is the choroid. Myopic eyes tend to have a thinner choroid, and that thickness of the choroid, it may be an artifact of evolution from 
earlier species where they accommodate by pushing the retina forward or pulling the retina back. But even in the human where, of course, we use the crystalline lens to accommodate, but our choroid responds to th in thickness as well. If you put on a three diopter plus lens, a positive three diopter lens, now the focus is in front of your retina, right? Your choroid will thicken within five minutes, not by much, only 10 microns. And that's not to cause any visual benefit. It's like 0.03 diopters, but the choroid will push the photoreceptors towards best focus or pull the photoreceptors back towards best focus. And dopamine is thought to have a, play a role in that process. And finally, the more dopamine you have in produced by those amacrine cells, um, it will trickle through the RPE and cause changes to the biomechanics of the sclera. Imagine the stiffer the sclera, the stronger the breaks on eye growth via collagen remodeling. Uh, there's a nice paper here from uh, Michelle Pardue's group where they um, actually trace out the different retinal chemicals and how deep they penetrate into the retina. And suffice it to say, there's a cascade of biochemistry that is starts with optics, starts with the photons, and it ends with the elasticity of the sclera in the back of the eye. So that was a little bit about eye growth. What about myopia progression? So first, just the anatomy of myopia. If you're a one diopter myope, that means that you're assuming the anterior segment is the same in these two eyes, which for the most part, like 90% is the case. Um, your eye is too long by about 300 microns. So one diopter is a 300 micron shift of the image plane. Uh, here's a graph of the prevalence of myopia. So you can see it's been skyrocketing and it's not just smartphones and iPads that came like around 2010, but even before that, it's really a problem of um, urbanization and near work. And the rates are very high. Over 90% of young people in East Asia are myopic and the World Health Organization estimates that by 2050, um, half of the planet will be myopic. Half of the planet. <clears throat> Um, I like this figure here. The x-axis is grades uh, in, in school in about 5,000 kids in eastern China, 16 uh, different schools. And the prevalence, by the time you graduate, the graduating seniors, are 90% of the graduating classes are myopic. 90% of graduating high school seniors in eastern China are all myopes, whereas almost none of them are myopes when they start kindergarten or first grade. And along with myopia goes the percentage of subjects that are high myopes, have myopia greater than six diopters. Once you're in a high myopia territory, I think you're, the retinal specialist here can talk to it better than I can, all the risks and dangers that come along with high myopia, retinal tears, myopic maculopathy, glaucoma, the, your, the risk of getting those potentially permanently blinding diseases skyrockets with every diopter of myopia that you have. So what can we do about it? Well, there is hope, there are interventions. So now I'm just gonna uh, summarize a few of what those interventions are. I think the first one was orthokeratology, which was stumbled upon by accident. In ortho-K, it's kind of like braces for your eye. You wear a mold overnight and it remolds the shape of your eye so that in the daytime, your cornea is a little bit flatter. It takes about 12 hours for your cornea to reinflate and go back to its normal shape. And um, these investigators found that just for myopia correction, they found that those kids wearing ortho-K lenses, they progress slower than um, kids that wear spectacles or normal contact lenses because orthokeratology aspherizes the cornea and creates positive power or um, uh, spherical aberration in, in the cornea. So it affects the peripheral image quality of the peripheral retina. You know, you use your fovea to read and they say you use your periphery for motion detection, but your eye does a lot more. And it turns out that the periphery of the retina is very important for regulating eye growth. There are many soft contact lenses out there um, for slowing the rate of eye growth in kids. There's only one FDA approved contact lens. It's the Cooper Vision MySight. Uh, here's their clinical trial data. So for three years in the control group, the children are becoming more and more myopic in the control group. In the MySight group, they're also becoming myopic, but less so. There's no way to stop myopia progression. You can only slow it down. That's the best that we've come up with so far. And um, another uh, intervention are spectacles. Uh, these are four um, most commonly used different types of spectacles for slowing the rate of eye growth. They all basically scramble the contrast in the peripheral retina. Uh, there's also atropine eye drops you can use. And um, the mechanism of action with atropine is to increase the dopamine concentration in the retina. 
And there's also light therapy. This is a, a kind of a recent one, but there are these spectacles coming out of Japan that they shine. They have little UV LEDs inside the spectacles that shine UV light into your eye. And the proposed mechanism of action there is that in the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that have a pigment called neuropsin that has a peak wavelength absorption in the UV at 380 nanometers, that if you stimulate those IPRGCs, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, they'll um, cause more dopamine to be created and a thickening of the choroid and a stronger sclera to put the brakes on eye growth. Uh, kind of uh, paradoxically, there's this other treatment now, why would I say this is a paradox? There's blue light therapy and there's red light therapy. These are opposite ends of the visible spectrum. They're on opposite ends of the rainbow. How is it that you can have shine blue light in your eye? That'll slow the rate of eye growth. That way you can shine red light in your eye also and slow the rate of eye growth. It seems kind of hard to believe. And maybe they're working on different mechanisms of action. But this company that is uh, making this take-home device, they claim that 150,000 children use this device every day. You're supposed to look into it twice a day for three minutes at a time, and you're just staring into a red laser. I don't recommend you um, stare into lasers, but um, I don't know. It's just something that's out there. It's really kind of wild west in this field because the prevalence rates are so high. There's so many children that are developing myopia, and it's not just a public health crisis, it's a defense crisis in China, like who's going to drive the tank, who's going to fly the jet, that they're trying, people are trying everything. There's so many different therapies out there, and um, the evidence is trailing behind. So there's some therapies that don't have very strong evidence behind them. So in summary, for interventions, there's contact lenses, there's orthokeratology, there's spectacles, there are eye drops, there are these different light therapies, and they all have roughly the same amount of efficacy roughly maybe in the best case, 60 to 70% reduction of myopia progression. They're all roughly around the same. And I think what makes these difference, I have two little kids. If someone asked me, well, which one would I pick? It really depends, I think, on the lifestyle of the kid and what are they going to comply with the best? You know, are they okay with wearing spectacles or is that aesthetically a problem for them and they want to hide their refractive error with contact lenses? That is the case for, for many kids. So it's really what, what's going to work practically is, is the best choice here. So every diopter matters. Why? Because if you're less myopic, there's less visual disability when you're uncorrected. When you wake up in the morning, you can see a little bit better. Um, if you're less myopic, then there are better op there are better options and outcomes of uh, surgeries. So, for example, in laser refractive surgery, there may be better outcomes for lower diopters of correction than there are high diopters of correction. And as I said earlier, you reduce the risk of permanently blinding diseases later in life. So, in conclusion, before we're all released to go outside, number one, take your take your kids out. They need to spend more time outside. Um, so that you can, you know, game their visual diet. So they're not just trapped indoors looking at near objects under artificial lighting all the time. Myopia prevalence, this is largely a behavior issue. Um, there's many uh, options to control or slow down the rate of myopia progression. And every diopter matters. And um, I'm just going to reiterate this, that it's really important to take uh, the little people outdoors as much as possible. And uh, thank you very much. If any of them prevent myopia progression, I'm sure somebody is looking at this in Asia. The question is yeah. prevention. Right. Um, I think there's some work being done with atropine used prophylactically. So do start to give therapies for myopia progression before you detect myopia. Um, I, I think there I don't have a clear answer for you, but I know that recently for atropine, that's been starting to be looked at. So we've done... Uh been involved in orthokeratology for probably 25 years or better. Um, and I think it's the one thing that probably offers, and at least in my hands, the best uh, slowing of progression. And we have several patients that literally show no progression over their all their formative years. Yeah. Um, you know, there's options of combining some of these things and, and, you know, putting atropine with it and so forth. But for the most part, I haven't found that it's not for everybody, uh -huh. but for the vast majority, they tend to do very, very nicely. Yeah. 
Do you have any thoughts on that or? Yeah, it's interesting. Most of these procedures are one size fits all. And in any of these efficacy curves, you'll see, oh, maybe 60% reduction in myopia progression. But that's glossing over the fact that there are non-responders. And like you said, there are kids that they fully stop their myopia progression. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to understand how can we customize it? Like how can, for this kid, what is the right treatment for them that's going to work for them? And, and, and that still has yet to be done. Lynn, do you want to comment on your some of the work you're doing with your colleagues uh, in uh, Australia on choroidal thickening? Just a quick sure. Well, it's fascinating. Well, there's a biomarker out there. If you want to develop something to slow the rate of eye growth, you could Im- recruit 300 children and treat them and have a control group of 300 and wait a year. That takes a long time. It costs a lot of money, prohibitively a lot of money. Or there's, I'll tell you about a a biomarker out there, which is the choroid thickness. Like I told you, the choroid thickens and thins um, within minutes. So we work with the collaborators in Australia where similar to what Susanna Marcos does in the adaptive optics vision simulators, you can have people try on a lens and measure, does their choroid get thicker or not? If the choroid thickens, this is a biomarker for efficacy and a slower rate of eye growth. Pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, coming to the question of myopia prevention, actually there is a, a, the only therapy for myopia prevention is just let your child play outside. And there's nothing, atropine is usually just 0.1% atropine is just to prevent the growth of myopia. It retards, the, it slows the growth, nothing else. You can't give atropine to prevent myopia, but at least to slow the rate of myopia. And there's a M myopia tool from WHO, which has come out recently. And that gives you all the prevention strategies and other things. So probably I think look at WHO tool for M myopia uh, that's come out recently. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. David, you want to close things for today? So just a couple housekeeping items here. If you parked in the parking garage or parking area, remember to use your QR code to get out. Um, and you'll be receiving an email link to a survey about the conference um, when it concludes. And please do your best to fill it out. We do look at those, and they're important to help us improve the conference. And finally, I'd just like to thank everybody. How about give us ourselves a round of applause today for a great conference. We really appreciate all the speakers and moderators that contributed today. Special thanks to Liliana Warner today, the Snell family, Helen Janice Ross, and all those who spoke and participated. Uh, We continue tomorrow. Breakfast is at 7.45 and the first presentation is at 8.30. The session will end at 12.30 tomorrow. Uh, And Rohit Khanna was here to deliver the Fred Duche Distinguished Professor Lecture. um, And we're looking forward to that. All right, good evening, everybody.